Okay, today I'm in the uh, Star Sports Mayfair shop with Tony Laws. But Tony, you work at the Star Sports shop in Woodley, and they tell me you've just celebrated your 80th birthday. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Never thought I'd make it, but we did. Now, you've been in the industry for how many years? This is my 55th year. I started in 1966. Okay, so um, is it better now than when you started? I would say no, a definite no. And that's for quite a few reasons. So what, what are the reasons? What do you well, mainly um, it's all computerised. Back in the early days, I was trained to do a job of work, learn the settling, and uh, that's all gone. It's taken a lot of the interest away. But I still love the game. Okay, that's with the old formulas and stuff. There, that's formulas. right, yeah. Explain yeah. a bit about how it used to work. Yes, yeah, so y you had, um, you had a, a pen and you had a pile of bets. And uh, the, the idea was to mark off the bets preferably scrub them out if they were losers, but then you had to settle them. And my first year in the business, um, I, I learned settling, and that was the best year of my life, really. Okay, now, when betting shops first started? 1961. Yeah, so you started in them just after? Just, just after five that. years after, So yeah. what, for the, for the younger people amongst us, <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's young. Yeah. What were, what were they like? Because they're not like this salubrious place now, are they? Were they? No. In the old days, um, when I first started, we had board men, and their job was to put the prizes on the board and then jot the results down. Um, I mean, now everything's computerized. It's in, in, to me, it's an entirely different world. And in my opinion, not one for the better. Okay, but also what people may not know is you weren't really encouraged to hang around in them, were you? No, no, people used to tend to come in, place their bets, then go. In Reading, um, as you said earlier, I worked for Dick Branson for 30 odd years. And we were lucky then, it was the start of the M4 motorway. And we had all the Irish navvies, cool mates to the end of work on a Friday, come in with their bets. And they, they were the good old days. Yeah, people getting paid in cash. Yes, and going in the pub. everything was cash. Yeah. 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 So you have you, in all those years you worked in betting shops, have you ever known a regular? I don't mean somebody's got a Yankee up, but a regular winning betting shop punter. To be honest, no. Every punter, each in their turn, has their little bits of luck, but no real consistency. Okay. Was there ever any? You hear about somebody walking in with a suitcase and uh, they've unloaded it all and they've won a fortune and you've never seen them again. Any of that sort of thing went on? It did go on, but I, I, I wasn't involved with it. I, I certainly didn't see a, anything like that. Okay, now you mentioned Dick Brunton. So he was a bookie that had betting shops in Reading and the surrounding areas. Reading and Bristol. Yeah, so what was <coughs> what was his background? Was he like an illegal bookie before it all started or a race course bookie? Or? No, he had a, a sweet shop. And... Um, Sorry, Dick, perhaps I shouldn't say this, but um, and I don't know for sure, but I think he took a few bets over the counter, which started him off. In the end, he finished up with 10 shots in Reading, and I think it was uh, probably four in Bristol. Right. And a very good man to work for. And you just apologised to him, so he's still knocking about, is he? Oh, he's still around, yeah. You still see him? No, no. We, we send Christmas cards each year. Right. Now, you... I was told, my research was wrong, I was told you had a betting shop, but in our little chat before we started doing this, you um, put me right, you had five betting shops. In total, yeah. Not all at the same time, um, over a period of, um, I suppose, about 15 years. I started off um, in a shop uh, in partnership with a guy in uh, Wallingford, and we had two shops, of which I was a partner. And I was there five years, uh, sold my share, and then I went on to buy other shops. Okay, so what, that was after you finished working for Dick? I started working with Dick, left Dick, and then I went back to Dick in the early 2000s, or like, yeah, 1990 to 2000. Right, so how did it come around? How did you um, suddenly decide to take the plunge to go in with your mate and buy these? By these shops, did you have a windfall or something? Was it? 
No, um, the, the chap's name was Eric, and uh, he he put up he bought the two shops, and but we were on a fifty-fifty. Well, it wasn't fifty-fifty. I was forty-nine, he was fifty, and I think the accountant was had one percent. It was as you sort of add them and got rid of them. But was working in one easier than owning one betting shop? I. In the partnership, I, I enjoyed going into work every day. Every day was different, it was exciting. You didn't know who you, you were going to meet, what type of bets you were going to get. Um, my biggest uh, worry was uh, we laid a bloke, um, a horse called Dancing Brave in the Derby, and uh, we laid a thousand eight to one, which in those days was a lot of money. And um, Greville Starkey rode uh, Dancing Brave, and he was right at the back of the field, but you could see him gradually coming through, and he just got pipped on the line. So that was a massive relief. Poor old Greville got a lot of stick for that, didn't he? Yes, you remember. I do. You're too young. Well, thank you. <laughs> the money's in the post. Um, now, it's interesting that you should mention about that, because I'm interested in, you get punters come in, you say some of them have, have their lucky days. So what would, what would be the if somebody's come in and had like a pound Yankee and the first one's one at thirty three, the next one's one at eight to one. At what point do you start hedging? Because of course, when you start hedging, then you're it's costing you money because they've Absolutely. only had twenty two quid on, haven't yeah. they? So yeah. what, give us a little bit about what the procedure would be in the old days. You got two good price winners rolling up. What would you, what would you do? Well, the th first thing we do is look at the other two, at the prices of the other two horses, then. Assuming they're going to be that price, work what the bet's going to come to, and then you hedge accordingly and do your, your limits. When I started at, um, in Wallingford, we did have limits of 10,000. But um, it, if you didn't want it to cost you 10,000, then you pick the phone up and went out. Right, so you'd use the limits as, you, as your target sort of pricing, because I suppose the more you have on, the, would you like to do a double the last two? You'd have to do a double, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, now did you ever work on course? I did, yes. When I first started, I worked in the credit office in Reading, and it was uh, owned by two bookmakers called Turner and Aidy. And at that time, they were two very large on-course bookmakers. And their son, Derek, ran the office, and that's where I first started the business. To... Um, Prior to joining them, I, I sent away for a, a ready reckoner so that I'd have some knowledge of it. And um, I placed this ready reckoner on my desk and the door opened from the main office and this big towering boat looked over me. What's that? I said, oh, it's a ready reckoner, sir. He said, come with me and bring that. And we went into his office and he had a big bureau and he looked at it, just flipped the pages, put it in the bureau and he said you won't see that again now he said get back in that office Derek will teach you the mathematics oh. and that's how it was started and how long did it take teach you to um, how long did it take you to master them I wouldn't say I was bright by any means but uh, that that side of mathematics did uh, I, I enjoyed so I, I think within three months I knew most of the shortcuts and settling Okay, so when you went when you went on course to work, where where was the first time you worked on course? I worked at Swindon Greyhounds with Derek Hady. Uh He had a pit chair, and um, he invited me over one night, uh, have a look around. Then he said, uh, "Do you want to be a floor man for the night? I pay a few bob. It's all in the back pocket." And uh, I, I began his uh, being a floor man for him. Then a little while after that, I done the book, and then. That was it basically, but I, I, I also um, I can remember, I went to the Derby, I think it was nineteen eighty two, and uh, I made a book. It was on a Wednesday then, uh, on on what they call the Downs, other bookmakers all all around you, and uh, taking bets. There was a a black woman came up to me, and I didn't think she had any money at all. But she wanted this horse and she had a big pair of boobies and she well she didn't flash them but she put her hand down brought out a pile of notes and put it on this horse 
lovely job. Really. You remember if it won? It lost. It lost. Yeah. Now you said about your when you were taking the bets on the telephone in the credit shop. Yeah. Would you have had like a field book? Yes. So you learnt to clerk, and that was the same as it yeah. was on course, pretty much. What happened was uh, w th there were three receptionists. I being one of them. And the idea was you took the bets and then you settled the bets, all three of you, and at the end of the day, you should get the same results from each settler. Derek, who ran the office, he ran the field book and uh, he jotted down everything so he could see where the liabilities were. Right, so going, so going from there to on course wasn't quite as difficult as it would be for no, anybody that's never no. done it. Now, you mentioned being a floor man, now this is going to be watched by people 100 years time hopefully so explain to us what the job of a floor man was right okay the floor man uh you've, you've got the bookmaker on the stand and you've got his clerk in those days it, that there were no computers writing recording all the bets in the field book and the floor man's job was firstly a check the prices on the other boards any changes that, that your bookmaker know um help with the cash take in the cash counting the cash after each race, uh, checking that it's all there. Uh, they were good old days. Uh, really sad to see uh, Snail go. Now, I suppose the prices at the Greyhounds, you wouldn't have needed to know your fractions very much, would you? Fractions were very important. And in those days, wh whether it be the race course or a dog track, <coughs> you had um, like 100 to 7 which in this 14 and two sevens, but now it's rounded down to 14 to one. So in a way, we are cheating the customers a bit. 107, 106, 100 to eight, all old fractions. And anybody watching this, if you go to a race course and ask for them, you still get them, mostly. I'm not sure on that. Well, like you do, you do. You ask, you ask for the fractions, they won't like it, but they'll begrudgingly oh, right. give you them. Right, okay, thank you. <laughs>